Hey gang, welcome to the Vickers Tactical YouTube channel. I got my good friend here, Tom Alibrando from IWI US. He is the National Law Enforcement Sales Manager for IWI. We're at the Take Aim Range in Pageland, South Carolina, and we have got some really cool IWI products for you today. Tom, take it away. Thanks, Larry. Um, so what we're gonna talk about is kind of the evolution of how we got into the X95. That's the newest series, it's been out. The IDF's had it for about six years now, of course. They work with it over there, and then it gradually works its way over here. We civilianize it, you know, we make it longer, it's semi-automatic, but um, we just want to talk about the evolution of how we got to this point with the X95. The original series was the TAR-21, or the SAR. Um, in this case, it's called the CTAR. It's the older looking, it looks like the Tavor, the traditional profile that you would normally see. And in the traditional profile, uh, the selector lever uh, had a, a 90 degree throw for semi-automatic and then you went a little bit further on almost like an M4 to full auto and that's how this one worked and some of the the things the profile of it obviously stands out the fore end has the slope to it and then obviously you have um, the traditional cutlass uh, grip on the front and the idea with the cutlass was when you're making an extended distance shot it created another point of contact with the weapon so you could engage targets at distance now, the, the one thing that uh, you'll notice about it is the charging handle um, was high about 10 o'clock or so, or you know, 2 o'clock, depending if you're right or left-handed. It can be converted. Uh, it did come in two calibers. It came in 9 millimeter and, um, and also 5.56. That's the primary caliber they use over there. So this is the baseline Tavor as they use it? Yeah, as, as the, the CTAR. The, the interesting thing is the original version didn't even have the Picatinny rail on top. It actually, I think you have uh, one of the original ones, it just sloped straight down. It had an accessory rail, but it didn't have the pick rail that went across all the way. Uh, when they started you know, going around to different uh, countries, US in particular, then that Picatinny rail became important because not everybody wanted an optic that was built into the gun, and that's what they did traditionally, mm -hmm. was that the optic was part of the weapon. Um, in this case, they can change what's on top, and, and that modularity became more important. So as everything evolved, it started working over to um, the X95 series. Now, they wanted to change the weapon, make it more modular. Um, they identified some things, some needs that they had, and that's when this started kind of taking off and evolving to what you're seeing nowadays. So the X95, uh, some of the main differences uh, that you'll have in the X95 is the magazine release button actually moved forward uh, right where an M4 would be. Mm -hmm. The older version, it had it um, right where the trigger system was in front of the magwell, and it actually works really well. It's, it, it's a slick system, it does work. Uh, but the one thing you still have, even in Israel, is folks running M4s. You know, big time. Yeah, so um, it eliminated some tactile confusion, is what I like to call it, because going from one platform to another, I gotta look for that, that button to index it, whatever. So everything else pretty much remained the same, though. The uh, magwell, the bolt release, still behind the magwell, which most bolt releases would be behind the magwell. That's what they have to be to kind of catch the bolt. That stayed the same. One of the other things that they changed was the cutlass almost didn't apply in this case because the forend is so short that you kind of have a hard time using that cutlass the way you want to. So they actually went to a traditional pistol grip and this is the actual pistol grip that they use in Israel. It's got the fatter panels on the side of it. This is what we use in the U.S. market, but this has the fatter panels on it. Um, and it, it's, it's a very modular system. From an armor standpoint of breaking it down, this is much easier to work on than the Tavor was. And the Tavor was pretty easy, to be honest with you. Um, but this carried over even you know, more modularity. When you pull the barrel out, the rail goes with it. In the Tavor's case, you have to pull the rail off. So you know, you'll lose zero. In this case, you still have to adjust a little bit, but it's not bad at all. Um, they also have pick rails on, you know, three, six, and nine all the way around the gun. Again, if I need to bolt something to the gun, laser aiming module, whatever, that makes life easier. Additionally, the charging handle moved more to the side to, uh, instead of being on top. So if you do have something on top of the weapon, you're not worried about racking your knuckles or anything like that. Um, so it, it just became a really modular system. You can change this pistol grip out for the cutlass. That's the other thing that, you know, oh, they, really? al they allow for it. Yeah, there's a screw that runs down the center. You pop that one long screw out, it's a traditional kind of pistol grip screw you might see in another system, um, almost AK-esque. You pull it out, you stick the, the cutlass on if you want to, and, and you can roll it. And there's a lot of guys that still like that cutlass, even in the civilian version for a majority of reasons. Hmm. Or, so it's, it's interesting. 
The one that they carried over is they put the um, traditional backup sights in this weapon that carried over into the X95. The X95, the reason that they call it X95 is a nine millimeter and five five six. That's that's why they went with that designation. It's still in the Tavor family, um, but the one thing that's um, it's changed a bit. And this is the five five six and the nine millimeter. Is with the 300 blackout in the U.S. and they, they kind of saw that that was that was a thing for sure. Mm -hmm. They started developing a platform that dealt with uh, the 300 blackout round, and um, it's being adapted, you know, for more military purposes too. But um, the civilian market actually got that first. Usually Drove that train. Yeah, it's a different one. It's uh, usually it's the military market mm -hmm. uh, that drives the civilian. In this case, that that cartridge in particular and its popularity kind of backfilled, if you want, if you will, uh, into this system right here. So the one thing that they had to re-engineer on it, though, that was different is there's actually a uh, gas port setting on the X, the uh, 300 Blackout series. There has to be. The and gas regulator, so to speak. It's a gas regulator, exactly right. Um, and it has nothing to do with suppressed and unsuppressed, believe it or not. That's that's not what it's there for. It's for supersonic and subsonic. Mm -hmm. So when you get into 300 Blackout and you look at the, the pressures that are subsonic and supersonic, they're, they're vastly different than almost any other cartridge out there because of, of the weight of the round and, and what's happening inside the gun. So they had to redesign it. It's a different bolt uh, and it's a different, uh, uh, different barrel, obviously. But that gas regulator has more to do with um, subsonic versus supersonic, not suppressed or unsuppressed. That's now, one thing I want to point out. Yep different colored magazine for the 300 blackout. Now granted it's interchangeable 556, but Correct. you guys adhere to one of my basic rules with that yeah, caliber. Exactly. And it's we we like it, you can stick a 556 around in this very easily. So we try to segregate the ammunition and, and uh, identify uh, that it is a 300 blackout because it's hard to tell sometimes if you've got a whole series of weapons out there. We like different colored magazines for that cartridge. Absolutely. That's so the way you know exactly you color code it. Yeah, it, for me, if you'll notice, I got all my 5.56s five, over there, and I drove that 300 blackout. I just yep. wanted it as far away as possible as that. It's just, it's it's something that, uh, if you're not paying attention, it can bite you. I want to bring up a couple things. Yep. We were talking about it yesterday, getting ready for today. The butt pad. Yeah, um, the traditional butt pad on an X95. This is 22.8 uh, inches overall. They run just a plastic plate on the back, for the most part. Um, the one thing we've discovered is sometimes it's, it's good to have that extra length on the back end of the weapon uh, for a couple reasons. One is you get a little bit more leverage on the gun for recoil management, but if I'm switching from left to right shoulder and I'm shooting this in my left shoulder, it pushes that ejection port away from my face. That way I'm not really dealing with any issues. So I kind of like having that extra pad on there. There's aftermarket pads that do the same thing that work extremely well. but. You know, I gave it a little bit more length, but it's a little bit more practical for at least my purposes and purposes of some other agencies that we deal with. Now, nine mil. Yeah. You use Uzi mags? No, it uses Colt magazines. Oh, okay. Yeah, traditional type, Colt type magazines. Um, so you can get them anywhere. We're trying to stay with non-proprietary magazines as much as possible. That's that's something that could be a deal killer for agencies or, or uh, civilian use is I get this really cool weapon and now I've got to find, track down this magazine, usually more expensive because they're harder to get in. It's supply and demand issue. So Colt magazines, that's all it uses. Regular M4 magazines over there and obviously 300 blackout. Again, I would change colors, but basically M4 pattern magazine. Mm -hmm. Cool. We're fixing to light this thing up. Tom has a really cool technique and why these mags are reversed. We're gonna go over that. Stay tuned, more coming your way.
All right, my buddy Tom is gonna take you through reloading the X95 bullpup. Tom? So one of the common misconceptions is that uh, because it's a bullpup, it's not as fast to run, not as efficient. There are things, particularly with the X95, that are M4-esque right off the bat that you don't have to worry about. You know, the magazine release lever button being up front, the selector lever being in the same place as an M4 would be, that's easy. The only thing you have to think about now is going behind the pistol grip to do the reload. So the way I explain it is, it's more like a pistol workstation than a rifle workstation. Everything's real close to the body. So let me show you kind of what that looks like and I'll talk you through it. Okay, cool. Right. Going hot? Going hot. So what I'm gonna talk about is the reload itself, uh, what you're gonna do during this reload. My workstation's a lot closer. I don't have to sink the gun down to get to the magwell. All I literally have to do is pin the gun into my shoulder, roll it palm up almost like a pistol. That's the way I think about it. So I'm gonna come up, I'll engage my target, boom, I get my nice hit. I recognize that the weapon is run dry, the gun's a little bit more center line, I hit the mag release button, let that fall. I insert the magazine, I'm gonna hold on to the magazine, I don't give it up until the bolt goes forward. I run my thumb up the spine, hit the bolt release, then I'm back on the gun, and I fire my next shot, okay, as soon as I remount the gun. It's very simple, it's very efficient. So let me try that one more time. You got it. I go nice and smooth. that away. All right, so I'll go about half speed so you kind of get the idea. I come up and good deal. You see how smooth and easy that is. It's just a matter of doing the repetitions and then um, you've got it. One thing I've already picked up on here would be key to make sure you seat the mag then hit the bolt release. Yes, so you're grabbing, the, the way we're, we're showing it is more of a beer can. Yeah. So you grab the bottom of that magazine, it stops, that thumb kind of comes back then it drives up the highway, which is the spine of the magazine, and gets into that. You don't want to grab that magazine too high. Most folks will, won't have too much of an issue grabbing the bottom of the magazine, so you're, you're going to have that magazine seat. Cool. Now, you got a double mag here, and I noticed yesterday you have it reverse of the way we normally run it here in the States with an M4. Correct. So the Israelis uh, actually run two mags on their guns occasionally, and uh, they'll have you know rounds forward, rounds rearward, and the reason for that, particularly in a uh, X95, uh, is it's so short they want to make sure their chin isn't hitting against the top of the magazine when they're actually mounting the gun. Um, the other kind of unique thing about it is when you do a mag change, it keeps the magazine on the same side. I'm not worried about occluding the ejection port, right? So everything's on this side. A byproduct of having it reversed is when you're shooting under recoil, the round's actually seating itself in the magazine. Right, not drifting forward. Yeah, which is what happens in a traditional magazine when they're facing the same direction under recoil, that top round will walk itself out and you either have to flick it out or push it back. It actually slows you down. Mm -hmm. So the way the Israelis do it is, you know, they'll, wet, they'll run that weapon dry, they'll come up and, you know, and there I feel it. And you just reach back and you're actually kind of re reaching towards your shoulder grab the magazine, rotate, insert, and then all you gotta do is take your thumb and hit the bolt release, and then you're back on it again. And you're good to go. Really simple. Excellent. Well, I remember yesterday when you showed me the guns, we were, we were doing our setup, and right off the bat, I was like, what's up with this reverse piece? And you go, actually, it makes a lot of sense. You ran me through it, and I go, dude, we gotta get that on camera. Absolutely, and it's it, it does, it does make sense. This is something they figured out over there, and now we're bringing it here. Yeah, baby. Absolutely. You guys run a Tavor school, right? Yeah, we run a Tavor school. It's a Tavor operator one, two, and three. And uh, the basic school, we run more of those than the twos and the threes, is I just have the weapon system, I'm at zero. I mean, everything from fundamentals to how it functions, to cleaning. And if we have the, uh, the range space, we actually take those basic students out to about 300 yards, so they understand what the gun's doing at different distances, not just close work. Now, if they want to find out information on the classes, where do they go? They're going to go to IWI US, and there's training right there. It's right on the top tab. That's going to tell you where the, the schools are and how to, how to sign up, basically. It's very centric to the uh, bullpup, our bullpup system, the Tavor, the older one, and the X95. We teach both platforms in that school.